A round notch may be a little more difficult to cut out than a saddle notch, and it also requires more experience when it comes to choosing the right log. The reason for using it is that it imparts a more natural appearance to the building. The problem is encountered when the lower log has been notched less than halfway. This log will shrink, such as at A and A, and the notch in the next log will become loose at the edges B, B. The solution for most situations is to scribe relief at the top of the notch, A, make the shoulders snug, B, B, and overscribe the groove. Start by making a small first notch to bring the high end of the log down. If the lower log has less than half the diameter exposed, A, your new log should retain its fit. If it is below the diameter, as in B, you should use a different notch to avoid creating a space at C, C. Most often, you can cut this small first notch by making a cut across the notch at the center of the scribe line. Then cut from the edge of the scribe to a point near your first cut and break out the segment of wood. Clean out to the center, then a few sweeping cuts will complete the notch. And it is always a good practice to brush in a little scriber relief at the top of the notch.
roll the log into place and line it up on the wall in the normal way. That is, snap a line down the length of the log and place plumb marks on the log ends. Move this line into register with the log below or the center line of the foundation, whichever you are using. Check the space between the logs and note this measurement on the side of the work. Increase the scribe width by 5 or 6 millimeters and place a second mark. This second mark will be the scribe width for the groove. Check the scriber bubbles at the level board and you are ready to do the final scribe on this log. Scribe the notches and if you are going to overscribe the groove, increase the scriber setting the required amount. This amount will depend on the type of building and its final designation but it will most often be five or six millimeters. In any case, increase the scribe distance for the overhang portion of the work. Then check your line to be sure it is complete and sketch in 5 mm relief at the top of the notch. Score around the cut line with a chisel or knife, then cut the notch and groove. Cut to depth at the center. This may be a single cut if the notch is small, or a wider cut if the notch is larger. Cut out the rest of the notch one quarter at a time. Work on the near side and then move to the other side of the log to do the third and fourth quarters. This work will go better if you cut out segments of the notch before you begin with the sweeping cuts and the brushing.
Trim the work accurately to the line with an axe or chisel and this log can be put into place. If the notch is so deep that it must recurve around the lower log, you might want to modify the notch to prevent a gap showing at BB. Scribe the log in the normal way, then mark points on the scribe line that are scribe distance above a level line that you have selected on each side of the log below. This level line may be at any distance above the anticipated origin of the possible gap, and a double scribe will be required from the level line down. Again, sketch in scriber relief at the top of the notch and increase the scribe setting to overscribe the groove and log end. Then set the log down on blocks for cutting. On the lower log, Cut out the portion from the level lines to the double scribe line on each side of the log. At the notch, join the points across the log on each side, score the cut lines, then shape out this modified round notch.
The lower portion of the notch is now housed and because you have left settling relief at the top of the notch, your work should bind well together as additional weight is added to the building. This format can be further improved by bringing the level lines to the top of the log, approximating the groove width. Place a double scribe line on the log and register the center line on the top of the scribe. When the rest of the scribe has been completed, measure out about one and one half inches or 40 millimeters on each side of the center line and draw a line here. Apply the same measurement on each side of the center mark you made at the top of the notch. The lower half of the notch is done much the same as the previous example. Cut a flat plane from the level line to the double scribe line and dress it out. Obviously, the more accurately this work is done, the better, and more natural will be the final appearance. I think it is a good and useful notch. straight down on each side of the center part of the notch. Then, with an angled cut on each side, complete the notch. Blind wall dovetail is used for partition walls, joists, beams, and other structural parts where it is desirable that the log should not appear on the other side of the wall.
first a small location notch to get the log in position. This will be done in the normal way, although the overhang of the log can be minimal. Snap a center line on the log, then position it carefully and dog it in place so that it will not move. Bring the center line of the log below up. This can be done by using a level from the center line of the bottom log and a square from the center line of the top log and joining these marks with a flexible straight edge. Cut off the end of the log to this line and allow the saw to score into the log below. Draw a plumb line on the end of the log, then measure the width of your dovetail on each side of this. Extend these lines up and mark the location of all three on the log below. These reference marks are very necessary and, like all layout, should be placed accurately. Determine the scribe setting and scribe the entire log. Then join the scribe lines across the end of the log. Place a level line on the side of the log. This line may be at any height you wish. The higher it is on the log, the smaller will be the dovetail, and the smaller the notch in the log below. To lower the line will have the opposite effect. From the place where the level line intersects the scribe line, mark two points on the lower log that are the scribe setting below this intersection point. The top log can now be removed. Join the two points with a straight edge and measure in the width you have selected for the small end of the dovetail. In this case, 80 millimeters.
The sides of the notch should be located accurately. This may be done with a level and a straight edge or some other form of projection. Score the cut lines and cut out the receiver for the dovetail. For the dovetail portion of the notch, first cut out to the level lines. Join the two points across the back of the notch and measure in the small end of the dovetail. This can be done by transferring measurements from the edge or by replacing the center line and measuring out. Score and cut each side of the dovetail to these lines. The notch is now complete.
This is a very useful notch and it can be used on one or both ends of a log. It is very stable and strong if properly executed. This notch, like many old and traditional things, is good, reliable, and in spite of appearances, simple. The examples shown here are more than 100 years old. The first half logs have been placed on the temporary foundation and the ends flattened to a width of 200 millimeters or 8 inches. Bring the center line to the top of the log either with two squares or by placing a vertical cleat at each side of the building then running an ink line or other straight line between them. The square of the building might be checked with diagonals from these points and the corresponding points on the other end of the building. Use this center mark for a reference to draw in the width of the wall. This will be four vertical lines that represent the four corners of the notch and that are joined in pairs across the top. Place marks on each corner that, for the first half log, are one half the height of the center line above the foundation. The inside corner and the diagonally opposite outside corner will be called zero height. The corner down the wall to the left will be 15 or 20 millimeters, that is one half or three quarters of an inch below zero height and the remaining position will be the same measurement higher than the zero position. Join these marks and note that the line is projected past the corner line to the end of the log. That's it. Just join these marks, score the back line, and you are ready to cut out the slope. The back cut should be very accurate and it might be worth your time to use a good handsaw to make the cut. However, a small chainsaw can be expected to do the job and in the hands of a good operator it will be quite satisfactory. The flat cut on this portion of the work need not be as precise as long as it is reasonable and that the plane is flat. This flat can be trued up with a power plane, slick or axe. Be sure that there are no high spots left and the work should be slightly low in the center. Lay out the three-quarter sill log in the normal way, then flat the sides to your wall width, in this case 200 millimeters. And do this for a predetermined distance, perhaps 18 inches. This can be done very carefully with a saw and power plane, or it may be done in a more rugged way with an axe.
flatten the bottom of the log where it is to fit on the foundation. Then put it in place on the wall. Use small wedges at the inside corner in addition to log dogs to hold it in a very vertical position. Place four plumb lines, one at each corner of the notch. Then use the distance between the bottom of the log and the foundation as your scribe height. And mark off this height at each plumb line. Join these marks. Again, this is the total layout and the lines may be scored and cut. This time it is necessary to cut all the lines accurately. Your log should then slide snugly into place. The first cut for the next logs should be done in much the same way. Join the existing vertical lines across the top, then place the level marks approximately three quarters of the way up the center line on the end. This height may vary according to the log size. Join the marks, cut the slope, and you are again ready for your next piece. The quality of your work will depend entirely on the accuracy of your layout and cutting.
Notice and tenon notches are made in so many varieties, styles and sizes that it would be exhausting to try to describe them all. Rather we will pick one, a post notch used for roof and timber framing that is in many ways typical. Simply put, a mortise is a hole in a log or timber and a tenon is a member that will fit into it. Choose the side of the log that you feel will be most suitable, dog it in place and snap the center lines. Place a center line on the end and a level line. In most instances you will work from the center line when dealing with round material as opposed to working from a face edge as when using square timber. An ink line or chalk line may be snapped horizontally if the log is short. Otherwise roll the log and snap the line straight down. Measure in the location of the mortise and with two squares locate the cut lines. By this means you can draw in cut lines that are 90 degrees to the center line. Next, we will determine the width of the seat cut, which will be very slightly less than the diameter of the post, or if the post has been flattened on the sides, it will be the width between the flats. The width has been marked on a level and a square used to locate the point. You could also measure one half of the diameter from the center line and use the level to find the point on the line below. Measure the distance between this point and the horizontal center line below and apply that measurement to the other three corners then cut out the piece. Extend the center line and lay out the mortise.
This mortise will be cut 100 millimeters deep. The end cuts can be made vertically by keeping the saw parallel to the shoulder. The side cuts can be judged by using a vertical reference. If the side cuts are a little inside the line, there will be material to make a correction and the final size can be determined with a template and a square. The layout for the post, the tenon portion, will also be taken from the center line. With these lines in place, again use your two squares to draw an accurate line right around the log. There are other ways to locate this line, but this is probably the most reasonably accurate approach. This line will provide the tenon. The tenon may be uh, made a little long and a final length cut later, but that is not strictly necessary. Draw in the end size of the tenon on the log end by squaring from the center line both ways. Extend these lines back to dimension the tenon, then cut away the side wood. More accuracy with the chainsaw is obtained by walking the saw down the cut and the operator is being very careful to avoid overcutting the lines. The tenon can be brushed to size with the chainsaw and completed with a large chisel or slick. Check with the template to be sure that the tenon will fit into the mortise. Place the post tenon into the mortise and brace it in an upright position with the center line plumb. It may be a good idea to check the center line on the end of the log also at this juncture to be sure that it has not been shifted out of the vertical. The post must now be braced the other way so that the center line is 90 degrees to the horizontal line on the beam. This may be done with nails placed to measure in a 3-4-5 triangle or a plywood template may be nailed onto the side.
set your scribers for the distance you want the post to be lowered. In our case, the distance between the top of the tenon and the flat seat on the beam. Check the scribers, then scribe the cutout for the beam onto the post. When both sides have been scored and cut, the job should be done.